Welcome to the lecture series on vitamins and nutrition. Today we are going to look into some more details on biotin and uh, in today's content I would like to explain the functional role of biotin although we have already started studying about biotin and its biochemical role we will study a little bit more refresh a bit and then we will go into the daily requirements and then we are going to concentrate more on the deficiency conditions associated with biotin and special application of biotin not only as a food supplement but elsewhere that can also be connected with food industry and also it could be useful in variety of other specialty applications. So, today we are going to look at the structure and we have already seen uh, that biotin is a structure consisting of three different uh, I would say chemical moiety. Okay. So, it is a very interesting structure and uh, the generalized deficiency of biotin is quite rare, but there are certain conditions where you have inherited diseases where people find it difficult in their physiology to really process uh, biotin and uh, probably end up in certain kinds of critical illness. So, you look at this structure although we have seen this I just want you to be aware of and brush up and connect the idea. So, here you have the uridor ring, the thiophen ring and the valeric acid sign chain. So, basically three different chemical moieties can be associated with biotin. Now, if you look at biotin we already saw biotin is a important cofactor for specific reactions especially for carboxylases and we saw in the previous class about the role of biotin for pyruvate carboxylase, acetyl CoA carboxylase, propionyl carboxylase and methyl crotonyl coenzyme carboxylase. So, all these reactions if you look at one thing is common. So, it all ends with this word carboxylase. So, it means it enables the biochemical reaction to proceed for addition of carboxyl group to the new structure that is being synthesized or it is been metabolically produced. Now, look at this you have this particular reaction and we have already seen how pyruvate can be added one more carbon atom extra by the way of adding a carboxyl group to the structure. So, you get oxaloacetate and this is very important intermediate compound and that enters in the synthesis of aspartate, citrate and phosphoenol pyruvate. Now, similarly we have seen other mechanisms. Now, I am going to brush up little bit on the functional role of biotin. So, you see there biotin is very important and plays a very critical role in the overall maintenance of immune system. Then in the cosmetic industry biotin is very important as far as the air growth is concerned and most of the cosmetic preparations you find biotin as a component and it is also useful for color pigmentation and also for the well being of nerves. So, these are the terminologies. Now, if you look at it which are connected uh, with we find the biotin source of related conditions. Biotin. Where exactly biotin is produced? So, you see there intestinal bacteria can synthesize this vitamin and it is a very good source. So, if we are not maintaining a proper uh, intestinal flora by taking up sufficient quantity of dietary fiber, we might have problem in getting a regular intake of this particular vitamin. So, that way intestinal bacteria, the probiotic bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract plays a critical role. So, in that way if you look into the supplement, it is more or less the fiber what you take in your diet would nourish this particular bacteria. So, although you may not be directly taking it as a supplement, but if you could provide fiber for the normal bacterial growth and this bacteria in turn would break down the fiber for its own survival and the metabolites that it tends to release many of fat soluble, many of water soluble vitamins come into that picture and uh, you find biotin as 
one of the components. Okay. Now, we have seen already about different fat soluble vitamins and we know that liver is exactly a good source for storing these fat soluble vitamins and as I told you earlier one reason why people quickly run short of I would say uh, water soluble vitamin is because it is not adequately stored in liver it is not that it is not stored at all but it is not adequately stored in liver. So, here you find biotin the general reservoir being liver and uh, biotin will also be eliminated or excreted from our system in the urine feces and milk. Okay. So, you see that the daily requirement of uh, biotin is around 200 to 300 milligrams per day. So, what we can consider suppose if the diet what we take is not supplementing the bacterial flora this will have an impact on biotin production because they form the primary source. And then again if we are not taking uh, foods or probably we are taking foods with a narrow spectrum I mean not really helpful in the gut bacterial growth then we might also end up having I would say deficiency for biotin. Now very special deficiencies if you consider suppose if people are on a diet of raw eggs I will come to that shortly and uh, yeah considerable amount of raw eggs probably we may not be taking like 20 raw eggs but let us say more consumption of raw eggs on a daily basis can actually cause biotin because there is a component in the egg egg white basically would neutralize biotin. So, it binds with biotin and this complex would bring down the bioavailability of biotin in circulation in addition to that we have this wonderful drug sulfonamide category. Although right now in the industry you find very few sulfonamide derivatives available, but still it is available we have we would not say that sulfonamides have gone obsolete. It is a very nice antibiotic in certain cases it is a broad spectrum antibiotic and the only preparation right now commercially available is sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim and we also have let us say silver sulfacetamide and many other drugs. Okay, so, what would be there? So, what these drugs would do? These drugs would actually compete with biotin. So, raw eggs have avidin which will neutralize which will bind with biotin and will prevent its absorption and sulfonamides would compete with these enzymes and thereby bring down uh, the availability and which eventually not treated or supplemented can result in severe deficiency conditions. Okay. So, now we are going to look at certain uh, pattern in which the biotin can be understood. So, you see over there the dietary intake of gut flora you find biotin and here you have biotinylated lysine. So, you have something like this this is the cycle of action would really circle around the biotin production and utilization. So, you have biocytin. So, what is biocytin? Biotinylated lysine is called biocytin and you can cleave using uh, I would say enzyme the biotinidase and lysine is released and the resultant compound is basically biotin. So, apart from dietary intake gut flora. So, this is the pathway that you could always trace even among lower organisms. Okay, so, this biotin again goes further and becomes hollow carboxylase because originally they were basically carboxylase derivatives and now you find over there that this particular enzyme is being utilized as a cofactor for variety of reactions. So, here you have apocarboxylase, hollow carboxylase, apocarboxylase synthetase. So, here you have hollow carboxylase. So, you know very well biotin is a very important vitamin for adding a carbon component and this hollow carboxylase basically can be cleaved by proteolysis and gives rise to biotinylated peptides. So, it means 
biotin when it is hooked to any of the side chain amino acids and we are going to cleave the protein. So, that component of the protein which is found with I would say biotin is called the biotin related peptide. So, you may ask like what is exactly happening over here. So, the dietary biotin is being utilized for many carboxylase reactions and biotin participates and we are just capturing a tiny bit of what action would be when biotin is consumed and how biochemically biotin would be processed and probably replenished when we are in need. Okay, so, you see there biotinidase is required to salvage biotin for reuse during cellular turnover. So, you see there biotinidase basically contributes in completing the cycle and if you ask what is the role it is fundamentally helping in recycling biotin. So, that is one of the reason why it is not very unusual to have biotin deficiency it is quite rare. So, you see there it is also released uh, it is also needed to release bound ingested biotin for absorption. What do you mean by that? So, the biotin what we consume from dietary sources could easily be prevented from absorption. So, what you have to do? You have to process it in such a way that it is not digested or destroyed, but preserved to contribute for these reactions. And the point here is any shortage of enzyme results in probably uh, escalated vitamin need or requirement than normal. So, this is something like I would say there would be a set pathway where these vitamins act like cofactor and if that pathway is not proceeding further one of the easiest things for our physiology or the cellular level is to make that particular substrate available in abundance and trigger all those processes that would make the substrate available in abundance and when that happens immediately your body would now be uh, what he say skewed towards that kind of uh, shortage. Okay. So, this is one way our body would try to draw our attention and thereby replenish the sources what it requires for maintenance and new development of tissues. So, you see that how uh, shortage of enzymes results in greater requirement of vitamin than normal. So, previously it was not so, it was not probably metabolically active and when people go into that particular kind of phase, they need more of these vitamins when they are processing the normal nutrients or macronutrients. Now, we are looking at certain diseases. Okay, so, this is an example of an inherited autosomal recessive disease. Okay, so, here you have hollow carboxylase synthase deficiency and biotinidase deficiency. So, you see there biotinidase is basically the one which is kind of salvaging back biotin for reuse during cellular turnover. So, it means what you have to consider uh, biotin being taken up and reused by cell. So, although we do have a reserve and the bacteria produces and it is all probably utilized and still we need this enzyme to complete the cycle to provide I would say uh, sufficient source of biotin to carry over with the functions. So, that is what we are we have mentioned here. So, how this is possible? Is there any case by which hollow carboxylase or biotinidase deficiency could be there? Yeah, it is there in any case it is a autosomal recessive condition. So, it is quite rare that way. So, you see there uh, as highlighted over there in the slide you find biotin responsive dermatosis. So, dermatosis, dermatosis is any lesion in the skin and the general I would say uh, response would be to immediately address probably the skin condition whether it is like itchy or flaky or both. Then we have kind of thickened lesions as you see over here. Okay. So, in this case you also find very high levels of organic acids are being eliminated in the urine. Fundamentally urine is towards the acidic range and here you pour out more of organic acids. And then you also see 
uh, tests on white cells and primarily we are looking at plasma, plasma to measure the enzyme levels. So, these are all kind of indirect correlation to validate what kind of inheritance deficiency the person might have in the utilization of uh, biotin. So, biotin has two kinds of applications. So, whatever we have seen already are subjected only for tissue related functions, okay. but now it is always as we say human beings can study well and take that application and apply it elsewhere and see how this works. So, biotin is one such example, very nice example to tell you how biotin or biotin related products have really made into immunology, cell biology and many other field. So, in this way in future if you are going to look at in details of pathology connected with food vitamins and deficiency, you will always be aware that many of those substances have been utilized in a way that your body would need them at that particular time of deficiency. Okay. So, although biotin in principle may have negligible side effects, but a prolonged deprivation can actually pose and in this case it is not the deprivation, it is the inherited autosomal recessive. So, it is a kind of a genetic disease where people find it difficult to especially adapt to the levels of biotin. Here we have one more disease and in this case it is called Lena's disease especially you see them among tiny infants who are probably fed with mother's milk and here you find a characteristic disease pattern erythroderma desquamatium and exfoliative dermatitis. So, what do you mean by erythroderma? Erythro means red, derma means skin. You see there kind of reddish rash on the uh, rashes on the skin. So, you call it like erythroderma. Uh, desquamatibum or exfoliative. So, it means like the top layers are well hydrated and moist and the skin is perfectly feeling good that will be wonderful. But what happens on a progressive manner if people would start losing the layers of the skin that is what we mean by exfoliative dermatitis. So, you have more turnover of the top protective layers especially the dead cell layer and the inflammation is persistent it does not like go for a period of time. And now you see how biotin plays an important role. So, they have attributed biotin deficiency or low intake of biotin in human milk as one possible reason how this thing could have happened or alternatively the person was taking biotin sufficient quantity but still they pose symptoms. So, that is one more category that you can consider for further study. Now, you look at this example one more conditions connected with biotin deficiency, uncombable air syndrome. Okay. See this term is there for quite a long time and people were not really sure how this thing is working. So, they found unless you supplement them with biotin or biotin related products, you can actually to some extent address this kind of conditions. See the examples whatever I cite or give you are probably extreme examples because bringing out a case from vitamin deficiency, some conditions are quite common and very visual and some of them may not seem like a kind of a big task but eventually you would find that they also contribute in the overall betterment of physiology. So, we should not actually uh, what do you say forget and try to connect the big picture of how a normal symptom can be treated with kind of uh, I would say vitamin deficiency. So, in this case it goes from one level to the next level. So, you look over here in this particular syndrome uncombable air syndrome, it is a condition where you find the air dry, frizzy and kind of independent. Okay. See whenever we have any condition the human tendency would be to immediately associate this condition with the existing knowledge of disease that we have already generated, but that may not work in all cases. Now, as far as this example is concerned, 
you do have variety of other syndromes resembling this condition and there comes the need for an expertise to really screen and tell you which is that particular disease of high priority that you, you should be working on with. So, you see over there this condition develops very early right from age 3 and becomes prominent right from age 12. So, this disease is accompanied by light of I would say a lot of social syndromes okay? and um, we are looking at how this disease is going to like really help us. So, this is one way by which you understand how biotin and biotin related components are useful in maintaining the overall moisture and I would say texture of the food sources in which they are added. Now, we are going to look at antagonists for biotin. So, this from this point onwards we are looking at one of the most popular applications of biotin. In fact, many people know biotin as a nutritional supplement. I mean very less people know biotin as a nutritional supplement, but rather are already involved in utilizing or preventing biotin to the way how it is required by our system. So, biotin antagonists one of the primary well known popular antagonist for biotin is avidin. Okay. So, from here we are going to discuss more on the applications of biotin in the therapy. Okay. So, now you see the egg white consists of a protein called avidin. So, that is what you call it like raw egg white injury factor. So, what is this? This raw egg white injury factor I would say would combine with avidin. So, the biotin will combine with avidin and this complex is quite strong. Okay. So, the moment they bind they stick with each other and they create a wonderful complex. So, how we are going to do it? You have avidin here and you have biotin here and if you could attach anything with them and allow this interaction to happen you may have brought a diagnostic tone. Okay. So, that is what exactly is happening around when we are talking about biotin antagonists the most common one being avidin. Next it is also a thermolabile substance. So, you can also look for other uh, protocols where they are engaging antagonists for biotin, but it is all for good not that we want to prevent biotin coming inside our system no not that way what we are actually looking at is if you could derive any therapeutic I would say advantage of using biotin antagonists. So, you see over there when a person is on a diet of just egg white you may have sufficient amount of biotin in circulation and also you have something called avidin biotin interaction and the moment avidin binds to biotin it would also inhibit the bioavailability of avidin. So, this is like we need to really consider and uh, how we are going to look at. So, on a dietary note if you consider biotin antagonists yes we would be deprived of essential biotin when we are around I would say white egg white that is one of the reason we have seen although egg yolk contains biotin and egg white will neutralize will absorb. So, end of the day we will not have. So, that is one of the reason why people say how come we will prove biotin antagonists. Right now we do not have any very critical uh, injurious way, but we do have a condition by which you would be able to analyze and tell you whether biotin antagonists are working or not. Okay. So, here you find how we have effectively taken up biotin from the context of food industry and how we have applied it in the development of immunotechnological methods. So, this is an example. So, you see there in the middle here you have avidin okay. and now this is fundamentally a surface of a well. So, the surface of the well will be too small the maximum capacity would be like 250 microliters and then you add the antigen. Okay. So, it could be any antigen and let us say we want to know whether any antigen specific antibodies are produced in the person. 
So, the moment you code the antigen what you are looking for okay, and then what you do you use a two tire system. So, what is this two tire system? The conventional ELISA would be you want to say whether this person is having reactivity or not. How do we do it? So, what we do this person would have raised antibodies in their circulation for the corresponding protein or probably any small molecule for which we want to raise antibodies. Okay, so, this is how every phase undergoes one by one in a very systematic manner okay, and almost for each enzyme water soluble enzyme and fat soluble enzyme you have a separate stretch of pathways which we have already started seeing and we will see some more. And now in this case you find this picture here you have a primary antibody and you have a secondary antibody and the secondary antibody generally would be coupled to a let us say uh, a marker system like enzyme or fluorescein molecules and so on. Then what we do systematically this coupling is used for detection of the primary antibody. Okay. So, for any kind of experiments where you are going to directly involve okay, detection, biotin elation would really help. So, you may ask what is that advantage of biotin elation, okay, how it is going to like really help. See, you should consider in ELISA kind of experiments very easily errors can be brought forth and the sensitivity is too high and you find it very difficult to really ascertain although it could be a quick fix for identifying any conditions on a long run if you consider you have to take up any kind of exclusive detection systems to make your system uh, look uh, responsive. So, you see this picture here you have the primary antibody here you have the secondary antibody and the secondary antibody is coupled to an enzyme system catalyzed and then the reaction is carried forth. But you find over here in this case where do biotin comes into play. So, what we are doing in the secondary metabolite we are adding I would say biotin relation. So, secondary antibody is basically biotin related or chemically conjugated with biotin. The moment it is chemically conjugated with biotin, so you add the antigen for which you want to find out whether that antibody response is there or not. So, this antibody will go and bind to the primary antigen present and the moment it binds it forms a two tire system. So, initially the first one I would say will go and bind and will create the pattern and the second one would be antibody to the primary antibody. Okay, so, that is what we consider it to be the secondary antibody, but one problem in the conventional method is since most of the substrates or leave alone substrates, most of the components which we use for any kind of reaction, we fundamentally use a two tire system of detection. Okay. So, now you find in this two tire detection system, you would have uh, avidin coupled with the uh, secondary antibody. So, you see there the avidin coupled with secondary antibody. So, avidin is connected with secondary antibody conjugate and now it becomes very easy. The moment you want to detect the antigen you add the primary antibody if at all present specific for the antigen will go and bind. The secondary antibody coupled to an enzyme in this case here you look at the secondary antibody being coupled with avidin. Okay, the moment it happens avidin will have a better affinity because the secondary antibodies are biotin related. So, I am going to give a quick um, recap of what we have done and you can take down the questions for today's session. So, what are the deficiency conditions connected with biotin and what are the applications of biotin. So, where biotin can be used in industry for development of new products. So, you have to go through this and you would be able to answer these questions. Thank you for your attention.